Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Walker. Um, let me first uh, ask Mr. Slover a question for the record, which means you can answer in writing and give a chance to sharpen your pencil and put your head to it. Um, you give general recommendations to make sure that public housing authorities uh, avoid the problem of the DC authority. If you'd be good enough to submit for the record more detailed proposals, you have a lot of members here who've proposed legislation. None of us support fraud or abuse. And uh, to the extent we can get helpful proposals to consider in legislation, consider this your opportunity to uh, do that. Would you be willing to do that? I'd be very happy to, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Mrs. Ventura, the, you heard Mr. Slover about his uh, unfortunate experience with the District of Columbia Authority. Are we seeing similar problems around Rhode Island and your dealings with other um, housing organizations in other states? Uh, how endemic do you think the problems are that he has spoken of in the District of Columbia? We are not experiencing a similar situation in Rhode Island. We have extremely competent housing authorities that are doing solid work on the ground serving the people of Rhode Island, providing um, excellent housing opportunities and um, frankly services. Services are very key to help people transition from public housing, um, the voucher program into um, solid working environment, um, home ownership opportunities. Um, so no, we are not experiencing this, Senator. And given the number of parties that it takes to pull together a housing deal. When we go to the ribbon cuttings, there are usually five to 10 different parties, private banks, consultants, different government funders. There are a lot of eyeballs on these deals before they come to fruition, correct? Yes, that's correct. So um, tell me a little bit about your experience uh, with first time home buyers. The average age for a home buyer climbing from 29 to 36 is a statistic it's a pretty grim fact for young families. Uh, how do you see that playing out, and do we need to repair that? Yeah, thank you for that question, Shannon. As housing prices have increased, and they certainly have increased along with uh, mortgage interest rates, we're seeing significant increases in the average income of a buyer in Rhode Island um, and in the size of their mortgages. The average income uh, for a home buyer in Rhode Island in 2023 was 92,000, and that's up around 44 percent. You have to be making around 92,000 to be affording a home. Yeah, over that same time frame, our average loan amount increased to 344,000. So that's an increase of 55 percent compared with 2019. So um, there are certainly challenges in the market. One of the the barriers that we see to um, achieving home ownership is the down payment. And um, that's why the $30 million that our governor set aside for down payment assistance was extremely helpful. Um, we provided a $17,500 grant to first time home buyers, and we were able to assist over 1,500 first time home buyers purchase their homes. So it was a, an important tool. Um, unfortunately, those resources are fully reserved, and we don't have any additional opera funding available. We'll continue to provide our resource, which is a $10,000 um, deferred loan, but um, it's challenging yeah. to find homes that are affordable. You know Thank that, you. Chairman. Um, Ms. Bailey, make the policy case between housing affordability and economic growth. Thank you, Chairman. The connection between housing affordability and economic growth is inseparable. Housing, having affordable housing helps people be able to access work. Also, building more affordable housing creates jobs for the people that are building it and for the people that will have to operate it. Um, it helps people in general be able to be more stable in the community and engage in work and engage in all of the things that a community uh, provides. And lastly, it helped being able to provide rental assistance is particularly important because we know that when people with low incomes are giving, given housing subsidies and other subsidies by the federal government, it allows them to invest those resources back into the community. They don't save that money, they spend it in their community, which helps economic growth as well. And um, Mr. Boyce, you talked about, you used the phrase intergovernmental partnerships. 
That implies a federal role. What is the importance of a federal role in those intergovernmental partnerships supporting adequate housing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with the many programs that uh, Carol identified from uh, home funds to choice voucher programs. I mean, all of those are catalysts to helping uh, families, uh, people like me who grew up in a tough and impoverished environment. Uh, but moreover, um, it's the continued creativity around the partnership, having access to new ideas and new resources, uh, and thinking through some of the proposals that uh, allow for increased home ownership, like um, expanding the uh, duration of uh, mortgage lending um, or um, uh, with the FHA mortgage lending standards or um, home funds that allow us to uh, expand affordable housing throughout our community in Central Ohio. There are communities that kind of have the NIMBY syndrome, not my backyard syndrome, where uh, they st cite housing standards as a barrier to affordable housing. Those home funds, in many cases, allow us to mitigate the cost of certain materials or certain products that uh, allow us to spread the affordable housing in communities that otherwise might not um, have the um, 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 permitting or variance resources uh, to allow for it. Thank you very much. The order uh, now is first Senator Johnson and then Senator Kane. I will take advantage of uh, Dr. Walker being here and his connection with Deutsche Bundesbank to uh, put into the record the report from the uh, Network for Greening the Financial System, of which Deutsche Bundesbank is a member, in which the network makes the point that we've made in this committee before, that climate-related risks are a source of financial risk. I'm quoting the executive summary here. Climate change will affect the global economy and so the financial system that supports it. The financial risks it presents are in consequence system-wide, a phrase we've heard repeatedly in our testimony, and potentially irreversible if not addressed. Senator Johnson, without objection, that'll be put in the record, and Senator Johnson, the floor is yours.